Now I'm going to talk about what I want to talk about. Now, there's a, um, a tradition at my gym. When I yell everybody, you guys yell fight. I, wanna, I want you to open up those lugs real quick, OK? Everybody? All right, listen up. If you don't do it, I've got to prove to make you guys, I got to prove to make you guys do push-ups, OK? Let's try it one more time. Everybody? All right, listen up. Anytime I don't think you guys are paying attention, I'm going to call that out. What I want to talk, to today, talk about today is just the, the, the parallels, the things I learned as a professional boxer. I used to be a boxer, but not so much about boxing, but the fighter mentality that you better have if you're going to get in the ring, because all boxers aren't fighters. Um, my father, I'll talk a little bit about how I got into boxing. My father was a professional boxer. Um, a lot of you guys, especially if you're a little bit younger than me, probably have never heard of him. Um, but if you've heard of Muhammad Ali, has anyone heard of Muhammad Ali? Get those hands up, come on, I know you heard of him. All right, raise your hand if you've heard of the rope dope the term rope dope All right, good, my dad's the dope. <laughs> He's actually, that's him, that's him. So um, he called, he was like, I got dope. They said, yeah, rope dope George. So he was a professional boxer in the 70s, made a, he was actually the highest paid athlete in the 70s, et cetera, back when boxing was big. And then when he was like 26 or 27, he was like, you know what? I'm gonna be a preacher. And at the time, like boxing was so much bigger than basketball and football, it would have been like LeBron, LeBron James tomorrow just saying, you know what, I'm done with basketball and preaching on a street corner. You could just walk up and talk to him. So he did this and his, but he didn't want to touch boxing, didn't want to make a fist. And his brother, my uncle, started a small little boxing gym in Houston and he was just going over, he went over to visit his uncle, my mom uncle, and uh, he was hanging out and a lady walked up to him and said, George, uh, and I'm telling you this so you know I didn't just like, think like, oh, this is a cool speech. Um, <laughs> George, please talk to my son. Would you teach him to box? He's getting in trouble. He's on the street, et cetera. My dad said, no, no, send him to the church. I'm a preacher. By that time, he had got him a little church. He was off the street corners. Um, she said, no, I don't, I don't think I can get him to do that, George. But if you come down here and teach him boxing, I think you could, you know, spend time with his mentor. He said, no, 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 I don't do that anymore. I don't make fists. Send him to the church, and I'll work with him. Literally two weeks later, he goes to um, the gym, just saying hi to his brother. And he's like, what happened to that, that young man? True story. I said, he's in prison. He said, he's in prison. Um, him and his friend held up someone at gunpoint, convenience store. I believe his friend got shot and killed. And now he's in prison for a very long time. So he instantly, this is right around the year I was born, actually, 1983, took all his savings. He's about 300 pounds. He thought he was going to retire and um, put it all into building the George Foreman Youth and Community Center. It was a nonprofit. And at an early age, like, I had to do everything in that place, sweep the floors. I have scars on my head from, like, being a baby, um, trying to do too much, falling off fences. But, like, I lived in that place. And at an early age, um, we built it in 1983. Um, giving back just became part of, like, what I do. But I didn't know I was giving back. I was just going to the gym with that. And it was school, church, and gym. That's all I know. And um, the most, you know, and I learned a lot about giving back. I learned a lot more, more importantly, about the, how tough it is to be a part of a nonprofit and to get, give support over 25 years being part of it. Um, and we'll talk about that. But the most important thing I learned was that I was impressed with is I watched hundreds of people, thousands of people come through this youth center, youth and community center, where you paid your age in dollars per year. If you're 10, you pay 10 bucks a year. Or you just came for free, because that's how we roll. Um, and they were all learning to box, but none of them became boxers. Only about 1% of them ever even competed, just had like an amateur bout. None of them were professionals, but I saw this dramatic change, um, these, the effects, especially in my teens, that being part of this had on people's lives. Doctors, lawyers, some that we still work with to this day, youths, um, getting kids to graduate who normally would have been in prison, all the way up to people who are 50, 60 years old. And I got to finally witness it, get, witness it firsthand. Because remember, I worked in the gym. I never worked out in the gym. I was never a boxer. Um, so when I was 25 years old, cut to a little bit about me. Um, when I was late teens, my dad sent me to boarding school for a little bit, um, played sports. Um, then I went to Pepperdine University, studied business admin, actually took classes in nonprofit admin. Um, transferred to Rice University, got a degree in kinesiology, just to work for my dad. I wanted to be in Houston with him. And I was living high on the hog. I actually got to manage my father at the age of 21, 22, which is nuts. But remember, I didn't go anywhere but school, work, and so on and so forth with him. So <laughs> at that age, um, I became his manager. And I got to ride with him and fly on private jets. He, got, he did well selling grills, um, believe it or not. And <laughs> so I was right there with him. 
And we're running around selling a lean, mean, fat reducing grilling machine. I gained, I gained 300 pounds. <laughs> and so long story short, I called my brothers up. They're all named George, the six of us. And I got them on a conference call. And they've been teasing me. They said, George, there's no proof that you're a varsity athlete. There's no proof of it. And this was the, the joke. They all played college sports. In fact, someone here played my brother. Anyway, they said that. I said, look, if I have one amateur boxing match, will you guys shut up? Because I've been watching people come into the gym and have, I never did it myself. Yeah, we'll do it. Okay, that's my motivation. So I go into the gym, find my own trainer, train for a full year. I'm still traveling around with my dad. Lose 70 pounds, and I'm like, okay, dad, I'm going to have my first amateur boxing match. He goes, oh, no, you don't. And I said, no, 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 I really want to fight. And he would never talk boxing with me. And he said, you think I spent all that money for you to go out there and, you know, get your head beat up? And I said, no, dad, this is something I want to do. So I tried to have an amateur fight. Nobody wanted to fight me because of his name. I couldn't box a lick. I still can't box that good. But he said, he said look, don't have an amateur fight. You're just going to learn bad habits. Have a professional fight. I'm telling you this so you understand I'm not completely insane. Um, I was like, no, no. He's like, no, just have a pro fight because at least the guy will show up. You're just going to learn bad habits. I said, all right. He said, let me train you. I said, okay. He said, all right, before I train you, you're going to have to do, the first thing you're going to have to do is you're going to have to run 10 miles. I said, all right. So <laughs> remember, I'm still traveling with him at the time. And so he said, week after week, did you run your 10 miles? No. Did you run your 10 miles? No. Did you run your 10 miles? No, Dad, no. Um, but I'm trying. I'm going to do it. So finally, one day, he's fed up. I've just been using the recumbent bike and shadow box. And he said, look, everybody. I almost got you guys. All right, he said, look. I'm going, let's go to Payless. I think it was Payless or Famous Footwear. He bought me the cheapest pair of boots he could find, size 13, I'm a size 14. Took me to the ranch, true story, straight shot, and he said, let's go. And he got behind me in this little ATV vehicle. It's kind of like a little truck. Um, and he just sat there behind me for 10 miles, never got to walk. I'd never run more than three miles. By the end of it, there's blood coming out of my boots here. And I still have the scars on my heels from, that was like over 10 years ago. I said, this, this man's crazy. I think, he, I think he's crazy. This might be a point to this. So then the week later, after I had wrapped my heels every day, and um, he said, meet me at the horse track. We had this horse track. We raised horses. And um, he put a harness on me, not the horse. They put harnesses on horses. And he had me pull that machine. Remember, he followed me for 10 miles? And so I got down. Oh, I didn't even mean to do that. But <laughs> that's not the machine. This was this was. This was gentle work. This was light work. It was over here on the horse track. He had this machine, and he harnessed me to it. And he said, pull. So I pulled. Nothing happened. So then I said, all right. Uh, almost had a, you know what. Um, nothing happened. So then I get down here. Uh, nothing happened. So finally, long story short, I'm trying to get it to move, and I, boom, head right in the mud. And he said, stop. And that's not, he's the guy, no, he's the guy taking the picture in this one. Um, he said, stop. I said, what? He said, stop. I said, all right. That's good. That's enough. I said, well, what, you know, I was just getting it going. And he says, no, I just wanted to see that you were willing to do whatever it takes to get the job done. That was enough for me. So I said, all right, he is crazy. <laughs> um, so long story short, we went on, we called it the, the torture chamber. Um, let me see if I can get this thing to work. Digging holes, chopping wood, sometimes... He'd have me dig him until I couldn't get out, right before, I, and then I had to put the dirt back in. I didn't realize that was coming. And then <laughs> wheelbarrow, there's a hill over there. <laughs> Push the wheelbarrow up the hill, and none of this stuff, all before I got to learn how to throw a jab. And I couldn't understand why the preparation was so much harder than, I mean, after my first year, the first guy I put in front of me, they call them in boxing bums or tomato cans, which means they're either not training or they're not that good but they're to get you used to being in front of the crowd. So I'm knocking these guys out. <coughs> boom, 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 minute. Then he goes and kills me again. Knockout, knockout, knockout. And it wasn't until, this is a funny story, I, um, I was with my, my uncle called me. He was a promoter, believe it or not. The same uncle from before. This is a horrible story. But he calls me and says, don't worry about this guy you're fighting next week. He's, he's big like me. He's out of shape like me. You beat him up in the, in the gym. So I was like, all right. Get to the fight. Show up to the weigh-in. <sighs> boom, boom, boom. Muscles coming out of his forehead, back of his neck, muscles. And I'm never, I don't even, I barely have muscles. And um, long story short, I look at the promoter. He looks at me. He said, what do you think? I said, what do you think? So I'm nervous. Long story short, I go into that ring. The guy was good. 
and he hit me. Pow! And I hit the ground. And it was at that time I got up, and I was so used, I, was, I had so much belief in myself that the referee was going. I was like, why is he counting for me? The guy's over there. And I look at my dad, and he said, use your legs. So I started moving around, and it was at that point I realized that he was not teaching me to knock people down. The boxing wasn't to knock people down. It was for me to be able to get up if I had been knocked down, to have the faith to fight the fear, to get up and say, you know what? I can do this. It was just that little bit of faith, right, to believe that the actions, if I got up and did something, something would actually happen. That's what, that's what fighting is about. Everybody get up real quick. Everybody get up real quick. So I'm going to teach you the difference between boxing and fighting, and then I have a quick checklist for you, okay? So this is boxing, all right? It's super simple. Take your left foot, put it in front of your right. Bend your knees. That's just like you're about to swing a baseball bat. You've all done this. Hands above your head. Pull them into your hips. Chin down. Fist tight. Stick your left hand out. Palm to the ground. Good. Squeeze it tight. Pull your elbow back into your hips. Stick it out again. That's called a jab. That's better than most fighters, right there. Leave it out there. I didn't say you could. <laughs> I'm serious. Put it out there. Watch, watch ESPN. Put your hand out there, right hand up on your cheek. Bend your knees. Now, I want you to pull your left hand. And as you pull your left hand, I want you to pivot on your back foot like you're mashing out a bug and extend your right hand. Leave it out there. Leave that right hand out there. Let's show I want to do push ups. Good. Hold it. Hold it. That is your right cross. Now, from here, left hand up. I want you to pull that right hand back. And as you pull it, reach around with your left hand like you're reaching around a, a, a tree. Fist tight. That's your left hook. All right? All right, you guys can sit down. That is boxing, okay? That is boxing. Now, those three punches can win you a fight at the professional level. You can pay 75 bucks and get, a, uh, get approved to do a USA Boxing amateur fight. That makes you an amateur boxer. If you get an eye exam, you can get a license to be a pro boxer. If they pay you, you're officially a professional boxer. That's it. Fighting, when do I throw the jab? When do I throw the right hand? When do I throw the left foot? When do I back up? When do I attack? How do I identify the person I'm fighting? What type of style of fighter is he or she? Is she a boxer, a puncher, a brawler, a counterpuncher? And what adjustments do I need to make? I'm sure you've all heard Mike Tyson say everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth, right? So that's fighting, OK? How does this apply? Now, look, obviously, you guys aren't going to go to the office and start throwing punches at everybody and <laughs> unless they deserve it. <laughs> Throw a body shot, trust me. Don't, don't hit him in the face, because the body shots, there's no, you know, the police. So um, this is how it applies, all right? So up here on the right side, what I've done is I've identified all the fights that I had to deal with, that I had to let these things I had to deal with in order to be a successful fighter. Um, everything I learned from my dad pushing me, but the problem is when, you, when, you're, when you're fighting, the, the hardest part is identifying the opponent. Number one, what kind of opponent? It could be one of these, right? But how do I know which one? And then once I do it, what tool do I use? That's why you need a corner man in a fight. Um, and I'll be brief real quick, because I know I'm going over my time. So what I've done here, real quickly, and don't try to read it all. It's in my book. I'm just kidding. I don't have a book. Uh, <laughs> um, on the right side, what I've done is I've aligned the opponents with the virtue that you use to fight. The idea that this equals character. Character is a quality under which you can depend on under pressure. That's, that's what we call character. So the purpose here is, how can I give you something you can, you can walk away with and say, you know what, I'm going to live my life like a fighter like George. Well, here's the, here's the recipe. Number one, you identify the opponent. Take in what you're feeling, whether it's at work, at home, they're all related. What am I feeling? Is it on that list? OK. What's the virtue I need to fight? Faith? All right. Well, if I'm using faith for my decision making as opposed to fear, then what's my action? In boxing, we call this an adjustment. I'm fighting a counterpuncher. I'm going to jab him. That's my action because I'm smart. That's my adjustment. It's a game of adjustments. And not getting tired of making adjustments is a big part of it. And that's it. And the reason this, to me, that, um, that this is important is that every time you win one of these fights, the organizational level, at the corporate level, it makes you stronger. It builds more character. Um, and character is important because it's tough out there right now. It's really tough. It's really tough. You got to keep trying things over and over and over and over until they work. And I'll give you a quick example, and I'll wrap it up. When I moved to Boston, so I was 
successful uh, professional boxer, 16 fights, et cetera. I come up to Boston visiting my friend. Equinox is charging $156 a month for a luxury boxing gym. The guy down the street at a nasty boxing gym is 130. So what if I charge 130 and give them Equinox like amenities? I had a carry-on suitcase. I stayed here. I said, I'm going to start a business. Remember Pepperdine, my business admin degree. I think I, that was a bad idea. But after six months, I thought it was going to take six months to open the gym. It didn't take six months. It took two years. And somewhere along the way, I'd spent every dime I had, every dime I had, and I went from this spoiled brat kid fighter, quasi mini celebrity, to literally sleeping in someone's room. I had a roommate, and I had an air mattress, and the box of air mattress came in. This is my, go ahead and laugh. And um, that, was, that's, that was all I had. And everything in me said, you know what? You should go get a student loan and go to school. I almost did that. I probably should have done that, too. Um, go back home. Tell your dad you were wrong. This is a bad idea, right? I can just get fat again. Go back home. But I had this fear, I mean, this faith. I had this faith that just like when you're chopping a tree down, if you've ever chopped a tree, right before it falls is the hardest part, right in the center. You swing it, whap, and it feels like it hits you back. And you hit it again, and you want to quit, but that's right before it falls. Um, when I was down pulling that thing, uh, my dad's in my ear saying, it doesn't start until you want to quit. It doesn't start until you want to quit. I know in that if I just lean in a little bit further, I can move in an inch. That's the only thing that made me stay in Boston. So instead of fear-based decision making, faith-based. I'm going to move forward assuming this is going to work out. I'm going to gather my nickels so I can get on the bus and get to the office at 6 a.m. in the morning, leave at 12 to get back at night. So what, I, what I'd like to encourage you guys to do is at every juncture you can, the idea is how do you train this? How do you make it strong, right? Is every juncture you can, you, you, you experience a customer, you have an issue with a coworker, um, you want to judge somebody. Stop and say, okay, take a moment. I want to judge them. I'm going to use compassion. That might force you to have a little compassion on yourself first because that's typically the only way you can give it to someone else. Um, Imitation, you're looking at everybody else, what everybody else is doing. Oh, they're doing this, I'm gonna do it. Guess what, everybody can smell that when you're copying people. Authenticity, right? Comfort, well, I don't wanna try, I don't wanna get on Facebook, I don't wanna try ads, I don't wanna get on Instagram, I don't wanna do retargeting. We do all these things and they're painful, but it's, le it's less painful when you do it when you don't need it, so that when everybody's doing it, you don't have a choice, you're not far behind. Stay away from comfort, that may take courage. My point is, if you use these things, the market's going to respond to it in a great way. And in a time where everybody's like, how do we, how do we communicate with millennials? Like they're aliens or something like that. <laughs> I hate using that term. But the truth is, we live in a time where you do have to communicate with them. They're going to be the, the donors pretty soon. Um, at a time where transparency is demanded, full disclosure is demanded, I believe the most important innovation that you can apply to your company at the corporate level, at the company level, individual level, the most, the most important innovation that you can apply is character. And that doesn't mean most of us have a mission that already has character. We have character, but it's, are we operating with character? <laughs> Someone's underperforming. They're about to have a baby. Do we fire them? Or do we try to restructure it and keep them on? I don't know. Um, you have a donor that I, I experience this. They want to give you money, but they want you to use it away, and you're like, man, I know that's not going to work. You know it's not going to work. Do you take the money and sneak? Do you take the money and do what they say and just come back, you know, like this? Or do you say, you know what, I'm going to apply one of these virtues, and I'm going to figure out how to be a better salesman and sell them my strategy and change the way they look at it. The market's demanding this. So I ask you guys, make a commitment. Make a commitment at the individual level to respond as a fighter, to fight these opponents this way. Make a commitment as a leader to, to foster an environment where your, your teammates feel like they can operate like this. But the most important thing is it's going to have to start with you, um, especially if you're running a company, because you need to inspire them with your actions, with your decisions that go against self-preservation, imitation, judgment, being reactive and so on and so forth. So having said that, I ask you guys, once again, if you're a fighter, any fighters in here, raise your hand. Any people want to commit to being a fighter? Come on, come on, come on. 
I know you. You better raise your hand. All right, guys, this one's for you. I'd like you to watch this. This is how we inspire our fighters. You should have seen the first version. Everybody wants to be great, but not everybody wants to do what it takes to be great. Because being great is painful. Being great takes fighting. Fighting every moment of every day against anything in the way of you and your dreams. When life knocks you down, you must ask yourself, am I gonna stay down or am I gonna get back up and fight? Let fighting be your first choice. The choice to take and throw more punches because the fight doesn't even start until you want to quit. So what are you going to do about it? Are you going to throw the first punch? Fighting is not a sport, it's a spirit. It's a spirit that awakens a champion deep down inside all of us and gives us that extra something that we didn't have yesterday. It's a spirit of hope. It's a spirit that reminds us that success is not defined by wins or losses, it's defined by our relentless will to fight despite the odds, despite the circumstances, despite anything in our way. So stop doubting yourself and be the champion you were born to be. Because it doesn't matter what anybody thinks. The truth is, if you wake up every day, whether it's a good day or a bad day, and you choose to fight, you will win. And on that day, it doesn't matter what anybody says because on that day, no one can ever say that you didn't have the fight in you. So remember, let fighting be our first choice. Choose to fight for anything and everything that matters. Love, happiness, freedom. Fight for others who can't fight for themselves. Although we may not understand everybody's fight, we all understand what it's like to fight. Fighters get hurt. Fighters bleed. Fighters get knocked down. Fighters cry, but fighters always get back up, no matter how many times it takes. So let your fear make you brave, let your wounds be your badge, and let your pain make you proud, because that's the only way you know you're a fighter. Stand up and fight, and I'll stand up with you. Everybody fights.